This is the Father's house, and Lord, we give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor. You are the everlasting Father, forever and forever, and you pour out on your children everlasting love, everlasting loving kindness. And today, Father, we say thank you. We say thank you that we can come into your house, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that we can proclaim you as the Father of lights, of the, as the Father of love in this place. So prepare our hearts, our minds, to receive all that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, can we give a big amen in the house of God today? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you can sit down. Well, good morning, Lilburn Alliance Church. It's an honor to be with you. I've preached maybe 30 or 40 times this year already, everywhere but Lilburn Alliance, so it's an honor for me to be here with my own church family and to be with you. It's, it's so incredible what we're doing here at Lilburn Alliance Church, amen? amen? I meet with a lot of pastors around the world, and I got to tell you, we got a good pastor. Amen. We got a good pastor, and I'm so thankful. Yeah, get, he's going to listen to this. Give him some... Give him some honor. Give honor where honor's due. And I got to say, I, I'm just so thankful for Fred and everything he's doing here. It's an honor that I have to serve with him. And, you know, the last time I was here was maybe about a year ago. And we have now launched about 6,000 new campuses of the College of Prayer around the world. Can you imagine? So I'm so thankful I get to run with Fred. And, and you know that he and our first lady, Sherry, had their 45th anniversary yesterday. Come on. Now that doesn't happen by accident. That happens when two people pursue the heart of God. And so I'm so thankful for the example they've set for us. Well, this morning, I want to call us to die. Now that may not be the message you came expecting to hear, especially on Father's Day. But this morning, I want to call us to die to self and come alive to love. To die to self and come alive to love. You know, as fathers, the best thing that we can learn to do today is to die a thousand deaths every day. To die a thousand deaths every day and every day to come alive to the love of God. There is no better place than our marriages and our families, our homes, in this church than to learn to die to ourself. In fact, nothing will impact our relationships more than our ability or our inability to die to our selfishness, to die to self and come alive to love. We've got to learn to die to ourselves. In fact, the impact and the fervency, the health, the results of every relationship that you and I have will be determined by our ability to do this. So we have to learn to, to die to self and come alive to God's love. And before we can do that, before we can come alive to love, we have to learn to die. We've got to die. Death to self. And one of the first things we learn to die to are our personal rights. In fact, nothing grows us in maturity of faith. Nothing grows us in this lifestyle of following Christ, like learning to die to our personal rights. So we learn to die to the way we want to spend our time, my right to my time. We learn to die to the right of our own resources, our finances, our money. We learn to die to our own possessions, our own space. And Jesus was the perfect example of dying to his rights, of giving up himself. In fact, in Philippians 2, 6, it says, Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He gave it all up. Certainly, if anybody could have held on to their rights, it was Jesus. Certainly, if anyone could have done what they wanted to do, it was Jesus. But he gave it all up for us. For us. Jesus was the perfect example of this. And nowhere are our personal rights challenged more frequently 
if we're going to be honest today, than in our, our marriages, our homes, and in this church community. And every day we have to learn to die to self. Few things will impact the intimacy that we have with each other, the intimacy of our relationships and our intimacy with God more than our ability or inability to die to our self. You see, if we refuse to die to our selfishness, it impacts every relationship we have. Now, we're all familiar here with the unfortunate reality of suicide, and I certainly don't intend to make light of that. But what I do want to help you understand is that every day, Jesus calls us to commit selficide. Selficide, to die to ourself every day. Now this morning, I want to give us an equation that I think is going to be helpful for us. It's an equation that we'll actually use in life, unlike many of the equations we learn as we're going through school. And I certainly was no math uh, major, so I'm going to make this as simple as possible. Situation minus self equals love. Situation minus self equals love. We remove our own rights. We remove our own desires. We remove our own priorities from every situation for the benefit of someone else so that they will receive love. After a long day, we might come home tired and our spouse needs our help around the house. Situation minus self equals love. Maybe the widow next door needs her yard mode and it's 150 degrees here in the Georgia heat, it's 100% humidity, situation minus self equals love. Maybe we've just put the, the kids down to bed and we're tired and we're looking forward to just sitting down and relaxing and our wife comes up to us and says, hey, would you, would you watch that cheesy Hallmark movie with me? And no, that's too far, that's, that's way too much at that point. No, no situation minus self there. But when we learn to use this equation, when we begin to live this out and die to ourself, we become like Jesus. We become like Jesus. And friends, I want to help you understand today, all of us to understand that the call to follow Jesus is the call to die. The call to follow Jesus is the call to die. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. He must die and take up his cross and follow me. The call to follow Jesus is the call to die. And, and the cross is this symbol of incredible death and incredible love. And when we die to ourselves, we die to our agenda and our selfish ambition, our selfish sufficiency, our temporal and humanistic views of success, of how we think things should be, and we die to our sinful behaviors. We die to our sinful behaviors. Paul said it like this in Romans 6.11, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We are to die to sexual immorality. We are to die to pride. We are to die to anger and unforgiveness and bitterness and all of these ungodly behaviors that we so often live with. And every time a temptation comes upon us to sin, to give in to our self, situation minus self equals love. We take ourselves out of the situation so that we can show not someone else love, but so that we can show Christ's love. We can show him love. It's the love of self that's the enemy to true love. It's the love of self that's the enemy to God's love for us. And for this reason, Christ invites every believer to die to self. The call to follow Christ is the call to die. The call to marriage is the call to die. The call to marriage is the call to, to die. In fact, in Genesis 2, we see that the first institution established on earth by God was the institution of marriage. 
And in verse 24, it says that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, this is here in Genesis 2. It's also quoted by Jesus in Matthew 19 and again by Paul in Ephesians 5. So you've got to understand that this verse is really, really important. So I want to take just a moment to unpack this for us here because the call to leave father and mother is the call to die to our past loyalties. When we become united, we die to our independence, our isolation, our privacy. When we become one flesh, we die to autonomy and individualism and egotism and all the things of life as we know it. We die to in marriage. Paul said it like this in Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, I want to give us a little bit of premarital counseling today. For those of us in the room who are single and maybe you're thinking about getting married, I, I just want to help you out a little, little bit here. Can I do that? Because when you decide to get married, you are deciding to die. Some of you have just crossed marriage off of your to-do list. But the call to marriage is the call to die. And those of us who are married here would probably tell you, if we're really honest, that we didn't know when we signed our marriage certificate, we were signing our death certificate. Now, before I let this linger too long, because my wife's here, I, I got to say, I love my wife. I love her. She's amazing. She's beautiful. She just celebrated her 36th birthday. Say happy birthday. Yeah. I love my wife. She's an amazing woman. But both of us would tell you that in marriage we have had to learn to die a thousand deaths over and over and over. Die to self. The call to marriage is the call to die. In fact, nothing exposes our selfishness, our arrogance, our self more than our marriages and our families. If I'm really honest with you today, nothing has exposed my depravity, my selfishness, and my, my impatience, my lack of love, my lack of concern more than my role as a husband and a father. Nothing. And so we have to learn to die to self. But, but see, marriages and families can also be the ideal environment for us to consciously take off the old and put on the new, to identify our old self and remove it from our lifestyle and to become who we are made to be in Christ. It's our environment where we can learn to receive unconditional love from the little things like when we're Sitting down on a Saturday watching a football game, here comes fall. This is a little bit of a warning. Roll Tide. The little things like when we're sitting on the couch watching a football game and our wife says, I, I need your attention for a minute. Situation minus self equals love. To the bigger things like maybe we disagree on our finances and the way we should spend our money. Situation minus self equals love. You see, fathers and husbands, we don't hold on to cling to our rights as head of the household. We die to self, we come alive to love, and we become servant leaders. We don't want to control our marriages. We don't want to control our children. We die to self and become a servant leader. So the call to follow Jesus is the call to die. The call to marriage is the call to die. And the call to be part of a local church family just like this is the call to die. It's the call to die. It says in Titus 2.14, Jesus gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Who are his people? The church. That's us. And he gave himself up for us. He died for us. And we are to respond accordingly by loving his bride, dying to ourself, 
and all the ways that we think church should be being done. Hello. We die to our consumerist mentality when it comes to church. What is the church doing for me? How is the church serving me, 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 me? We die. A thousand deaths. When the worship songs aren't what I want, situation minus self equals love. You see, the sooner we learn to die in our marriages and die in our families and die in this church community, the better off we will be. Why? Because when you're already dead, there's nothing to lose. All you do is gain. You don't lose anything when you extend forgiveness to someone who has wronged you. You don't lose anything when you give up a week of your life to serve in VBS. You don't lose anything when you sacrifice some financial resources for someone who is in need. You don't lose anything because you're already dead. All you do is gain, gain. We're always so focused on what we lose when we give something up. But when we're already dead, there's nothing more to give up. So all we do is gain. You see, every day we have the opportunity to die to ourself and if we don't get it right today, we get up and we try again tomorrow. You see, I think too often that we allow our moral failures and our relational failures to build up into this mountain of failure and defeat that we feel like we can never climb over. That we can't get over it. We look at the mountain of failures before us and we lose the courage to ascend. We see all of the failures of our marriage and of our parenting, of our leadership, of our relationships, and we see a Mount Everest of defeat and failure. And friends, listen to me this morning. It's at that moment Jesus comes. It's at that moment when we're looking at that mountain of failure. Jesus comes, and he says, die. He says, die. It's at that moment that because of his love, he takes us by the hand and he begins to lead us up that mountain of failure and defeat and to stand at the top under the presence of God, God and claim his victory. I was in Nepal back in March and they were telling me a little bit about the history of, of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. Incredible. Incredible. And they told me that it wasn't until 1953 that somebody first summited Mount Everest, got to the top. Before that, people had tried and they had failed. Thousands of people before that. And then in 1953, somebody finally summited that mountain. And since that time, thousands of people have gotten to the top. They've summited Mount Everest. But it took someone. It took someone who believed they could do it. It took someone who had the courage to face all of the elements. It took someone who probably failed a couple of times and kept trying and trying and trying. And friends, what I want you to hear today is that Jesus has already climbed the mountain for you. He has already conquered the mountain for you. You can trust him. You can get behind him when you die to yourself and come alive to his love. You can have victory. In the name of Jesus. And it's at that moment that we come alive to love. We come alive to love. True love is unconditional. It's selfless. It's self-sacrificing. But before love can be a behavior, love must be experienced. Before love can be a behavior, love must be experienced. It actually has to be encountered. And friends, you and I have the, the best example of love right in front of us as followers of Jesus Christ. He is the best example. And marriages and families and churches can be the, the best places to learn to give and to receive the love 
of God and come alive to love. God intends for this church and for our homes to become places where we die to self and discover new life. We come alive to the unconditional love of God, not once, every day, over and over and over and over. Now remember our equation for love, situation minus self equals love. Say that with me one time. Situation minus self equals love. You see, Jesus had a situation the night before his crucifixion. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was wrestling with what was about to take place. He was asking God if, if there's any other way, deliver me. You see, all of the, the torture and the pain and the curses and the, the isolation, the death. He knew all of that was coming his way. And in that moment, situation minus self equals love. He displayed the greatest act of love in history. He removed himself from the equation, from the situation. He put into place this equation because he loves you. He loves you. I believe that when Jesus hung on that cross, your face came to his mind. I believe that all of the faces of humanity throughout history flashed before him. And he stayed on that cross because he loves us. And it's an encounter with this love that will change everything. You see, the greatest love you will ever experience in life is not found on your marriage bed. It's not found in the arms of a significant other. It's not through accolades and awards. The greatest love you will ever experience, that you will ever encounter, is found at the foot of the cross in the presence of Jesus. And it's that love that changes everything. It changes our motivations. It changes our relationships. When we die to self and come alive to love and we begin to put into this practice, this equation, situation minus self equals love. He showed us how. You see, when we learn to die to self, it doesn't mean our life loses value. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm teaching here today. But what it does mean is that we discover our greatest value when we realize that our highest worth was paid by the one who paid the highest price. And he paid the highest price for you and for me. He gave it all up because he loves us. He loves us. So it elevates our value in his presence. See, we need God's love. And oftentimes we need God to heal our ability to receive his love, our love receptors, our ability to receive and perceive his love. We, we so often need God to heal that because understanding the love of the Father will revolutionize our life. It will change our motivations. It will impact every one of our relationships when we come alive to the love of God. And there is nothing more important than to every day begin to receive the love of God over and over and over. David said in Psalm 92, it is good to proclaim your love in the morning. Jude said, keep yourselves in God's love. Why? Because his love is like taking a vitamin to boost our spiritual immune system every day. Every day. His love is like the antibiotic for all of our sin and disease. You see, his love is the antibiotic to all of our pride, all of our lust, all of our arrogance. Everything that you and I suffer under, his love is the antidote to. And it's his love that breaks down the walls that divide us, the walls of race and denominationalism, political beliefs, finances. It breaks down all of those walls. His love overcomes all of that. You see, and it's when we begin to realize that when the Father looks at us, he looks at us as though he's looking at his son. That changes everything. 
It says in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, since you have been raised to new life, we've come alive to the love of God. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Now listen, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Come here, Alan. Now I want you to understand this today because it will change everything for you and I. When we begin to realize that the Father loves us so much that we are hidden in Christ and all of the, the love that he has for his son, all of the passion he has for his son, all of the favor he has for his son, he has for us because we are hidden in Christ. And when he looks at you, he looks at you as though he's looking at his son. This changes everything when we're hidden in Christ. And it's because we're hidden in Christ, because of that love, because we've been given new life that we can let go of all of the nasty earthly things that are lurking within us. We can let it go. We can die to self. And it's God's love that motivates us to do that. It's God's love that changes everything. And when we die to self, we take off the old, we put on the new, we become who we were meant to be in Christ. You see, this love and this hope motivates us towards purity and righteousness. It's, that's why the love of God is the antidote to our selfishness and our sin problem. You see, we've got to start focusing more on the love of God than we do on our sin problem. See, I think too many of us are so focused on our sin and all that happens when we all focus on our sin all the time, it creates an atmosphere of shame. Hello. And shame never motivated anyone. Shame just demotes us. That's why shame is always Satan's voice, not God's voice, not the Father's voice. Shame demotivates us. So we can't just focus on shame all the time. And it's when we receive the love of God, come alive to his love, that it changes everything and it motivates us to die to self, to come alive to his love. You see, while Satan works to demote us, God's love works to promote us. It works to promote us to a, a greater degree of intimacy and a greater degree of holiness and a greater degree of righteousness, a greater degree of his presence. It's all about his presence. Love must fill us before it can pour out of us. And this only happens as we allow the Father to love us. To love the self out of us. To love the self out of us. You see, our new self is who we are in Christ. And as we grow in Christ, we become the person we were created to be as his followers. Paul says it this way in Colossians 3, 9 through 10. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. You see, we've taken off the old. We've died to self. We've put on the new. We've come alive to love. And friends, when we do that, we become like Jesus. We become more like Jesus. And when we become more like Jesus, we become more like love. Because Jesus is love. He is love. In fact, he is our greatest example of love in human form. He is the full embodiment of love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It, does, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Thank God. Now, there's four always of love that are mentioned there. This is in your notes. But I want to just unpack those for a minute here because they're really important. The first is that love always protects. It always protects. That means it covers an offense. It never takes up an offense. That means we learn to release people out of love. It always trusts, love always trusts. That means it remains committed and faithful and loyal. 
Our default, because of love, is to trust other people. Now, some of you here have had your trust robbed from you, taken from you. And I'm here to tell you today, Jesus wants to restore that. He wants to restore your trust because love always trusts. Love always hopes, it delights in, it fully accepts others for who they are and it assumes the best about people before it assumes the worst about people. There's a whole message right there because a lot of us get that backwards. But it always assumes the best about people and then always perseveres. Love never gives up, thank God. Some of you are here today and you feel like Because of all your past failings, you can't be loved. That that Jesus doesn't really love you, but I want to tell you today that his love perseveres. He hasn't given up on you. You're never too far from the love of God. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on others. Love perseveres. Love perseveres. Now, obviously, this love is humanly impossible apart from Christ, but in Christ. In Christ, it's ours for the taking. In Christ, it's ours to be had. And we want it, but we have to die to self. And every one of us here, we want to come alive to his love because I I just got to tell you this real quick. Every one of you in this room is his favorite. Every one of you in this room is his favorite. If God had a refrigerator in heaven, your picture would be on that fridge because he loves you. He loves you. If he he had a a nightstand by his bed, I'm not assuming God sleeps, but if he did and had that nightstand, your picture would be on that nightstand because he loves you. He loves you. And and when we come alive to this love, it, it changes everything. We begin to receive his love. And see, Jesus said to his disciples, freely you have received, now freely give. And here's a kingdom principle for you. Everything you receive in the kingdom of God, you can give away. Amen, is what you should say there. Everything we receive in the kingdom of God can be given away. And so we learn to receive the love of God. We come alive to the love of God. And we give the love of God to those around us in our marriages, our church family, our our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our schools. We give away the love of God because we've come alive to love. We've been filled with love. And we can give it away. Because true love does not exist apart from Christ, we, we can be free. We can be free from ever having to feel like we must produce love in and of ourselves. You see, you are not the source of love. Thank God. I am not the source of love. My wife is really thanking God. Jesus is the source of love. He is the full source of love. And you and I are the conduits of that love. That's all we are. So some of us need to switch on the light switch. We need to turn on the power because we need to get connected to the power source so that the light of his love can flow in us and move through us to those around us. We're the conduit of his love and our lives will never be all that they can be until we come to grips with this kingdom principle, this kingdom reality that we must die to self and come alive to love. It changes everything. And our part is that we must join God in the transformation process. We must join God in the transformation process. And see, he chooses to use our marriages and our families, our homes, our churches to transform us. To use those things to refine us and to call us to die to self and come alive to love. Why? So that we'll be happy? Nope. So that we'll be holy. You see, I think that there's some wrong thinking among many Christians today that God exists to make us happy. And I just want to tell you this morning, God's main priority in your life is not to make you happy. His main priority is to make you holy. Hebrews 11 says, without holiness, no man will see God. And he wants you to to encounter the fullness of his love and his glory So his desire is to make you holy. And it begins with dying to self and coming alive to his love, the fullness of who he is. This is what motivates us, the call to holiness, the call to his presence, the call to more. 
He loves us. He loves us with this never-ending, always and forever, uncontainable, unfathomable, unending, always and forever type of love. He loves us. I wish somebody heard me today. He loves you. He loves you, church. He loves you more than you will ever realize. And the call to death, the call to die to ourself is not that we are nothing. It's not that we lose value. It's so that we can experience and encounter the full value of who he made us to be because he loves us. Would you stand with me, church? You see, our inability to die to self and come alive to the love of God will impact our character. It'll impact our leadership. It'll impact our influence. It'll impact our relationships. So choosing to die to self and come alive to love and enter into fellowship with God changes all of that. It, it lets us enter into relationships to a, a greater level of trust and love than we ever thought possible. When we die to self and come alive, And it's that love that motivates us to put this equation into practice day in and day out in our marriages, our families, in this local church, in our relationship with Jesus as we learn to die to self. We put this equation into practice. Situation minus self equals love. It's not overly complicated. He loves you. And he wants the best for you. And he wants everything you've got because he's given you everything he has. Amen? Father, would you help us this morning? Lord, we want to learn to die to self. We want to learn to die to all of our needs and wants and desires that keep us from loving other people the way you've called us to. We want to die to self so that we can remove every obstacle that would get in the way of our intimacy with you. Would you help us this morning, Father, to die to ourself? Would you love the self out of us this morning? We want to come alive to your love this morning, Father, because your love is good. It's good, and you are a good Father, like we sang earlier. You are a, a good Father. In fact, I just want to lead us in a prayer this morning. If, if you want, I want you just to pray this with me. Father, today, I want to learn what it means to die to myself. I can't do it on my own. I need your help. And Lord, today, I want to come alive to your love. I want to receive the fullness of your love for me so that you can fill me up and you can pour that love out onto other people through my life. I want to die to self and come alive to your love today. over this place right now. Lord, especially for fathers. Lord, today as we have this Father's Day, I pray that every father in this place would learn to die a thousand deaths for our children, for the sake of our children, so that they can see your love. Help us, Lord. 